All right. Thank you guys so much for spending time with me. And we're going to get through a lot in about 10 minutes. Uh, we're going to get through 50 slides in 10 minutes. And I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about design for your startup. Um, let's get right into it. At the end of the day, there's four steps. We got to empathize, prioritize, illuminate, and create. And let's not waste any time. Let's dive right in. What you need to think about when you're thinking about your interactions, your website, your front end experience, it's a conversation that happens a thousand times per day. It happens millions of times per day if you're very successful. And one of the simple things is actually just even being polite. And so simple things like when you're having a conversation with someone, make sure you wait your turn to speak. Become genuinely interested in the people that are your users who you're having that conversation with. See the other person's point of view. Be sympathetic. And it's, this is all review for a lot of you, but it just bears repeating. This is where design starts. Design starts with actually something as simple as read How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's the cheesiest book recommendation I have for people, but it is the most valuable at the end of the day. And you wouldn't believe how many startups forget these incredibly basic principles from a, you know, kind of a very cheesy self-help writer from the 1920s, from the Great Depression. These are simple concepts. Start from there. At the end of the day, it is about empathy. When we're building something for other people, it is about feeling their pain, their problems. And one of the things that's interesting is you can kind of think about your problem, your, pro your product, and uh, what you're building as actually a party. Too often, people think of them as um, th this incredibly complex thing like building a car. It's actually a lot more like a great party. When you go to a party, you know, you, someone meets you, they're really nice to you. They welcome you. They take your coat. They say, hey, get a drink over here. By the way, your friends are over there. That's what a great experience feels like. And so it doesn't matter if you're a consumer experience, a SaaS business, or an enterprise experience. All of those things basically kind of resolve back to this idea of treat it like a party. Is it a good experience? Is it fun? Is it interesting? Do I feel welcome? Do I understand what's going on? Do I understand what I should be doing next? And this is hard. One good mental exercise that you can use is sort of you know, think of yourself as someone who's even designing an airport. It's actually very, very hard for someone who is the architect of that airport to take a moment and think through, for instance, something as simple as, where should the signs be? One of the most powerful things that I saw happen working for Paul Graham at Y Combinator was actually that. Not only is he incredibly smart, not only was he a great computer scientist, but he had this incredible ability to put himself in the shoes of someone who had never had that experience before. And so, you know, in an airport, when you walk in, one of the hardest jobs is, where do you put the signs? And that's actually what you have to do when you're designing your experience. You need to walk in and be able to put yourself in the shoes of someone who has never been to your website before, your experience before. And that can be really hard, because you remember everything. You know all of the parts of that thing that you're designing. You know all the things that you want them to do, and you actually have to forget all of that. And it's, it's a really hard thing to do. You also have to know what problem you're solving. And if you don't have a problem, you actually create two problems. You know, these are all inventions that were created to solve not the problem of other people, but the problem of the inventor themselves. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a fundamental thing out there. You know, probably the biggest thing that startups have to solve uh, is finding something that people actually want. And so you have to be very, very direct about what is that problem and who has it. And if you don't know what that is, that itself is a problem for you. We've gotten the first part out. Let's see, how are we doing on time? Looks like we're doing OK. Uh, <laughs> I actually have to speed up quite a bit. So the next part is let's prioritize. Who's the problem for and what is it? Next, let's actually break down the steps and then add priority. And this is you know, sort of your basic product management. You really have to say, these are the things we're going to do in the first version, P1. We're not going to ship without it. P2, you know, 
those are all, typically still things that you need to take care of before, but maybe you don't start on that first. P3 and non-goals are just things that you just call out directly. Hey, in this iteration, we're not going to do it at all. And that also helps you because that's also called product management. The classic problem and the reason why you have to scope things is because you only have three things uh, to deal with when you're trying to decide what to do. You can, you can basically do less, you can do it more, you can deliver something that has lower quality, or you can do it later. And for a startup, that's the classic problem. You don't have infinite resources, and you do have a significant time constraint. And so the, often, the most important thing that you have under your control is scope. All right. So now we're going to get in the nitty gritty of how do you actually do design, or what should you be thinking about as you actually create the wireframes? All right, so a bunch of you guys did that. The sim this is really stupid simple. People do what you tell them to do. Remember, when we started this conversation, we said, hey, every interaction you have is a conversation. And actually, what you can do is use direct command language. If you don't use co direct command language, this is what you get. And this is what most home pages actually look like. It's passive voice. It's a description of a thing that isn't necessarily personal. It's not even clear that it's for you. It's not even clear what the problem is. And I don't even know what the next step is. And so the simple fix is really this. This is the solution for your problem. And then a concrete sentence that shows, hey, this is for you, and then a button that is direct command language that says, hey, let's solve this right now. So, hey, we're actually doing pretty good on time. Now let's talk about visual design. And this is, you know, it's really hard to get through everything you need to know about visual design in uh, about two minutes and 55 seconds, but we're going to try. Um, the basic, simple first principle is use only what you need. And this is actually a really common problem. Uh, there's this incredible concept out there by Edward Tufte. Uh, I recommend you read all of his books. But the basic idea is that, hey, there's a, a lot of the hallmarks of bad visual design is actually chart junk. So if, this is, if you put something on a page that is not a part of the minimal set of visuals necessary to communicate the information, then that's actually chart junk. I'll show you what that means. You know, on the left-hand side, what we have is a graph, but what does that green mean? What does that red mean? Like all of those, you know, that's immediately what your eye gets dr dr drawn to, but why is that there and what does that mean? Or the gradients on the right side, why is that there and does that even mean anything? In this particular case, probably not. And so this is where beginning designers really start to fall apart because it feels like design is putting your own personal voice in, making these arbitrary choices that uh, somehow you know, say something about you. And it's, you know, it's not that. Like Visual design is not plumage. It serves only the, the actual use case in front of you. And so the way you can avoid this very concretely is if it can be removed from a design, remove it. If it can be removed without taking away meaning, remove it. And so my favorite example of this is very simple, colons. You see this all the time in forms. If you can remove them and have the same meaning be, be there, just remove them. Colons are actually dumb in the, in the context of a lot of communication and a lot of, uh, you know, frankly, forms. I can't stand them in forms. So, you know, ornament is basically not signal. And, you know, this is uh, a lot of what drives uh, both flat design and the iPhone ongoing. At the end of the day, contrast is your number one tool as a visual designer. Because it, as the, as the designer, you're saying to people, hey, this is important. And I'll give you an example. It's really straightforward. Things that are bold that have more contrast, you pay more attention to them. So they're more important. If they're not bold, they're less important. And then if you keep adding things at the same weight, notice that even the things that are even less important, they, don't, they seem as important as the less important thing. And in fact, if you bold everything, then you sort of lose all meaning. And so this is a very fundamental example of showing that contrast is probably the number one thing as a designer you should be focused on. If everything is bold, nothing is bold. 
And you know, this works in the reverse. You can use color, you can use size, you can use position to make things even more important than that thing that was bold. All things are contrast. My favorite thing for you, oh, and I, I'm out of time, but I think I have another minute or two, right? Um, you can have the squint test. So look at your design, squint your eyes at it, and you can immediately see what is the biggest, highest contrast thing. That's the thing that you're telling the user, pay attention to this. So beyond that, we've got closeness. And this is just a simple pet peeve of mine. Like, why is that login button so close to the create area? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Seriously, WTF. So just make sure things that are related go together. And that really just goes a long way to being uh, you know, a good experience for people. Beyond that, use a grid. Uh, there's a lot online you can learn about grids, so I'm going to speed through this. But what you'll notice is, again, contrast is what drives people's eye that then allows people to know, here's what I should be doing, here's what I can pay attention to. And uh, my favorite book that you should read is Don't Make, you, Don't Make Me Think by Steve Krug. It's a very fundamental idea that let's look at what's going on on this page and allow users to figure out my eye will go from the heading, I'll scan, I'll figure out what I want to pay attention to, and then I'll jump to the body area that really matters. Really quickly, again, with the ornamentation. A lot of people just use it kind of in a random way. Don't do that. How to lay stuff out? Hey, first use some padding and margin. If you can't figure out how to do that, then, then use a line. And if all else fails, especially if you need to draw your eye, hey, you can use a box. It's really straightforward, really simple, but that's how you should, that's how you should think about ornament um, in a very minimal way that gets out of the way of the user. So that's my talk. I think we made it to maybe 11 and a half minutes, so that's not too bad. So in review, empathize with users, prioritize those features, illuminate the path, and then just create great stuff, guys. You guys are building the future. I'm so glad to be able to share this with you. If you want to see more of this, I actually have a 90-minute free talk on the Y Combinator Startup School homepage, so go check that out. And then you can reach me at gary at initialize.com. We are investing, so thank you so much for listening to me.